Dragon's Dogma 2 is a bitter pill to swallow. It is everything that I would hope it would be. It is an incredible game. It's addictive. It's immersive. Last night, I streamed it for a couple of hours. The next thing I know, I'm up until 2 o'clock in the morning playing the game. I'm having so much fun with it. But at the exact same time, it's also the most conflicted I've ever been on a game. Because of more reasons than I can count. The community and many of the people that have purchased Dragon's Dogma 2 are upset, and justifiably so. And we're going to talk about that, but we're also going to talk about Capcom's response to it. But Dragon's Dogma 2 is an incredible game that has so many self-inflicted L's, it just doesn't make any sense. How do you release a game that doesn't have the ability to start a new game or delete your save? Dragon's Dogma 2 is currently an 87 on Metacritic and an 89 on OpenCritic, with 96% of reviewers recommending the game. Content creators who got early review copies have almost universally jumped in to say that it is one of the greatest RPGs to play and have had a great time playing it with very few caveats. I've played the game for just over 10 hours now, and while that isn't enough to write a full review, I have to agree that the game is fantastic. Combat feels great, the world is gorgeous, the design of the world makes you want to explore every corner, and you often get distracted by exploring rather than questing. Dragon's Dogma 2 feels like a genuine adventure rather than simply a game, and it's something that I think anyone can appreciate about the game. Now, one thing that every reviewer touched on was the performance of the game, and it's something that has echoed quite loudly. I put out a video just before the release of the game warning many viewers that Common issues had popped up that reviewers had faced, cautioning my viewers to bear in mind that the launch of the game may be relatively unstable, and lo and behold, it was. During my 10 hours of play, I didn't experience any crashes. However, more populated areas of the game had considerably more input lag than others. Screen slowdowns, blurriness, textures failed to load in, screens were stuttering, and more. In the open world, it really wasn't much of an issue. The game remained relatively stable with very few issues, however, with how often you need to return to towns to manage your storage and deal with quests, it made every trip back to town something I wasn't looking forward to. I often found myself completely immersed in the game, slow panning the camera, looking around beautiful vistas, RP walking after downing an ogre, overburdening myself by picking up every single item that I could find, only to return to town and visually be ejected from my immersion because the performance started to tank. Now, just for a bit of context, I have a Ryzen 7 5800X, 64 gigs of DDR4 RAM, and an RTX 3080. I do not have a mid or low range PC. It's relatively high spec, though there are more high spec PCs than mine. And after a bit of tinkering, locking the game to 60 frames, I didn't really run into very many issues. The game played relatively fine until I go to towns. Anytime I go into a town where there's more NPCs, that's where the game tanks, and it's a known issue that Capcom obviously knows about. They've made a statement to the players. And before I talk about that, I want to say this. This is a single-player, $70 AAA game developed over five years by one of the largest studios and publishers in the entire industry. One of the most recognizable names in gaming. One whose CEO has gone out and said that they believe that games should be $100. There is no excuse for this game to release in such a sorry state. Period. That's it. End of story. They chose to release this game to players knowing that it wasn't ready for launch. Not pushing the release date. Charging us full price. And that's something that we should be upset about. The people that are upset, myself included, are justifiably upset. And this game is a guaranteed hit. They knew they were going to make money off of this. People have been anticipating this. Pre-orders were through the roof. There was no reason to release this game in this state. Except for the fact that, well, Capcom's fiscal year ends on March 31st. We aren't strangers to rushed releases. We see it more times than not. And in some cases, it makes sense, but in others, it doesn't. Helldivers 2 released to a variety of issues. However, it's a live service game from a 100-person studio that was hit with unexpected success that led to their servers being overwhelmed. Capcom has over 3,000 employees, releases smash hit titles year over year, and has been in the industry for almost 45 years. Customers' expectations are wildly different when you're asking for a full price of $70 and you have the pedigree of being a Capcom game. 
Honestly, most players would probably shrug off performance concerns, believing that the solution for the issue is right around the corner, right after release. However, Capcom compounds the issue by raising the stakes of players' expectations through the use of both microtransactions and de nouveau. While these are completely separate topics entirely, the more pressure that you place on your customers, the less likely we are to be forgiving for your mistakes. This is a $70 single player game with microtransactions and an evasive anti-pirating software that is known to impact CPU performance on a game that is suffering from CPU performance issues. It's not hard to imagine why players are upset or why they're lashing out. If you've been online, you've likely already noticed that the players have taken to Steam to voice their concerns over the performance of the game and especially the microtransactions. Professional reviewers and content creators were unaware of the slew of microtransactions that were tacked onto the game last minute just as the game released. And that leaves a really unsavory flavor in the customers' mouths because we feel like it was implemented in an underhanded way. What's more baffling to the customers is the items that are being sold. Wake stones, the items that we use to revive, keys to get out of jail, the ability to edit your character's appearance, and worst of all, rift crystals, the currency that we use to rent pawns, and port crystals, the items that we use to set teleport points in the world. Now, I take issue with the last two more than anything else. The pawn system is endemic to the game. It's one of the most unique features of Dragon's Dogma 2, and selling the currency needed to interact with that system undermines the purpose of the system itself. It's a community-driven system where we customize pawns, level them up, give them quests, get experience for them, and then share that with other players. It's effectively monetizing a community-building tool, and it just feels wrong. Selling port crystals is a whole new kind of low that I don't even think Ubisoft has tried to explore. And it sharply contrasts with the words of the game director, Hideki Itsuno, who didn't want to put a lot of fast travel into the game because he thinks it takes away from the experience of playing an RPG. Going as far to shame other games, saying, give it a try. Travel is boring? That's not true. It's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. Only for us to find out later that teleportation is being sold in the game. CoCarnage on Twitter posted some dialogue challenging players who have waved off the microtransaction concerns in Dragon's Dogma 2, saying, Just don't buy the microtransactions. Easy. No. For many players, that's not how it works. The problem is simple. When you want to sell something, there has to be a need for it. It's easy for us to surmise that everything in a microtransaction list, take Dragon's Dogma 2 for instance, is extra or unneeded, since you get it all in the game. No harm, no foul, right? Wrong. When you try to sell items, you try to make a need. You need an impetus for purchase. When you start attaching money into items you earn in-game, who is to say the game developers were told to make sure that we limit X item because they are selling it as DLC? And he's right. It's not hard to come to the conclusion that Capcom limited fast travel in Dragon's Dogma 2 so they could sell port crystals as DLC. And that might not be the case. However, it's not hard to come to that conclusion because it's staring you in the face. And my Dragon's Dogma 2 fans will know that having the ability to set your own teleport points with port crystals is an incredible advantage, especially in the end game, especially when fairy stones become far easier or far more accessible or you even get a permanent one. And chances are we're going to see something similar here in Dragon's Dogma 2 because the game is massive. So <laughs> it's not hard to come to that kind of conclusion. And I've seen a lot of players that have brushed it off. Oh, is this your first Capcom game? We've seen this in other games. You can get all these materials in-game. And while that's true, it doesn't excuse the practice in the first place. And that's the problem. Because these convenience purchases motivate developers to make games less convenient. Simple as that. I looked at the microtransactions for Resident Evil 4, which I played. Resident Evil Village, or even Monster Hunter games, and now Dragon's Dogma 2. And I just sit there asking myself, why? What is the point of some of these items in the first place? Because as somebody that plays these games, you look at it and say, why would anyone want to buy this stuff? And it's because they're going to try to motivate us to buy those things in the future. And all it does is just, it serves to add question marks and tarnish the reputation of a game that would otherwise be heralded as one of the greatest RPGs of all time, sitting next to Elden Ring and Baldur's Gate 3. But instead... That's not what it's going to be.
And I think it's really important to make that comparison to Elden Ring and Baldur's Gate 3, games that set a standard for players that we are seeing reflected in the outrage from customers. Players of Dragon's Dogma 2 have likely played both games and have brought those expectations to a game that deserves to be held to the same standard. However, Capcom does not share the vision or perspective of FromSoft or Larian Studios. Baldur's Gate 3 was applauded for its public stance on microtransactions. Reading from the game's FAQ, they posted saying, No, there are no in-game purchases in our game. We believe in providing a complete and immersive gaming experience without the need for additional purchases. Enjoy the game to its fullest without any additional costs or microtransactions. After receiving the award for best narrative at GDCA, Sven Vinka, the head of Larian Studios, made a speech that sums up the issues of these self-inflicted wounds that we see developers make time and time again and it's almost poetic with regard to Dragon's Dogma 2. It's always the quarterly profits. The only thing that matters are the numbers. And when you fire everyone, and then the next year you say, shit, I'm out of developers, and then you start hiring people again, and then you do acquisitions, and then you put them in the same loop again, it's just broken. You don't have to. You can make reserves, you can slow down a bit, slow down on the greed, be resilient, take care of people, don't lose sight of institutional knowledge that's been built up in the people that you lose every single time, so you don't have to go through the same cycle over and over. It really pisses me off. Now, while Sven is referencing the layoffs, this is something that's applicable to all poor decisions made by AAA studios and publishers. We've heard the line lately that AAA games are unsustainable, prices need to be increased, games need to be further commoditized, more microtransactions, more live service, and etc. However, these are self-inflicted wounds that are cast upon the customer to take responsibility for. They are the ones that are setting unrealistic sales goals, over-budgeting their games, over-budgeting their marketing, not pricing their games fairly or making their games available enough to reduce pirating, not taking the time to ensure the quality of their product before launch, all so that they can meet quarterly and yearly sales to appease investors only to limit the overall financial success of all of their games in the end. Baldur's Gate 3 set a gold standard for RPGs, hell, for games moving forward because they showed that even with all of the issues that they faced, they could stay within budget, retain their people and not lay off, and not put microtransactions in their game while still blowing sales out of the water. In a recent interview, Sven Vinka came out and said that Baldur's Gate 3 has sold more than twice as many copies as Divinity Original Sin 2. That's over 15 million games sold for a turn-based game. That is insane. When I look at a game like Dragon's Dogma 2, sure, the issues are probably going to get fixed. Yeah, the microtransactions aren't really that big of a deal, but why add question marks? Why make players question your product in the first place? Why not come out and drop this monster of a game with no bullshit, retain your dignity and your reputation, make players love you. We, especially in an industry where there are so many villains and not enough heroes, why not just take the easy win and be the hero? I realize that there's going to be some people in the comment section or people that are watching this video right now thinking to themselves they don't want to be the hero because there's more money in being the villain. However, with how sales and community engagement has shifted over the past couple years, I don't think that's going to be the case anymore. Baldur's Gate 3, Pal World, Helldivers 2, Enshrouded, Last Epoch, all of these games are showing a trend of players buying games not because of the marketing or the name, but instead because of the reputation that comes with a quality experience, availability, fair pricing, and positive community feedback. Players are buying these games because other players are talking about them positively, and it's leading to viral independent successes that are exceeding the sales and performance of AAA releases. In a way, I see this as reflected in how Capcom has started the dialogue with their players over their concerns. It highlights a disconnect in how they engage with their customers versus the games that I mentioned earlier. Following the backlash on Steam, Capcom posted a statement saying, To all Dragon's Dogma 2 players, we would like to update you on the status of the following items, about which we have received numerous comments from the community. To all those looking forward to this game, we sincerely apologize for any inconvenience. Crashes and bug fixes. We are investigating slash fixing critical problems such as crashes and freezing. We will be addressing crashes and bug fixes, starting with those with the highest priority in patches in the near future. The option of starting a new game. We are looking at adding a feature to the Steam version of the game that will allow players that are already playing to restart the game. 
We will announce more details as soon as we can. Paid DLC. All the items listed below can be obtained in-game or as paid DLC items. Art of Metamorphosis Character Editor. Ambivalent Rift License. Change Pawn Inclinations. Port Crystal. Warp Location Marker. Wake Stone. Restore the dead to life. 500 Rift Crystals, 1500 Rift Crystals, 2500 Rift Crystals. Points to spend beyond the Rift. Makeshift Jail Key. Escape from Jail. Harpy Snare Smoke Beacons. Harpy Lure Item. Regarding frame rate, a large amount of CPU usage is allocated to each character and calculating their impact of their physical presence in various areas. In certain situations where numerous characters appear simultaneously, the CPU usage can be very high and may affect frame rate. We are aware that in such situations, settings that reduce GPU load may currently have limited effect. However, we are looking into ways to improve performance in the future. The Dragon's Dogma 2 team. In the future is not what customers want to hear about a game that they just purchased, nor is it what potential customers want to hear either. Not to mention that after I read this, I notice that this is just a copy and pasted statement, the same statement that was given to IGN before the release of the game. Like I said before, we aren't strangers to games not working as intended on day one, something that has become malignant since developers were given the ability to patch their games post-launch. In my eyes, this messaging exemplifies this exactly, as it just lacks the sincerity, urgency, or care to those who have spent a full price on a game that was released with known issues. The funny thing is, I love Dragon's Dogma 2. I really do. It probably doesn't really feel that way after making a video like this, but I definitely really enjoy the game, and it puts me in a really awkward position because I can see the game for what it is, a game that has a bunch of self-inflicted issues because of impatient greed more than it is anything else, and something that's really indicative of AAA to begin with. And I think it's fine to love a game for what it is, but also disagree with the actions of the companies and the things that they do to our games in the first place. And I realize that there's going to be some people that want to jump in to defend Capcom, to defend Dragon's Dogma 2. Don't worry, they didn't make it this far into the video. But <laughs> we're not trying to attack your game. We just want the quality of service that we deserve. It's as simple as that. It, you should want the same as well. It's not people trying to attack your game or take it down or kill your game or something like that. No, it's just people asking for the level of service that we require for the money that we spend on these games in the first place. And the performance, the over-monetization, the way these games launch, the everyday features that aren't being included in these games, lack of regional pricing, all of this stuff. This is something that's normalized by AAA studios, and it's not something that we have to stand by and watch. And to be honest with you, they can keep doing it. It's fine. Go ahead. Keep hurting yourself. Keep hurting your own games. Keep hurting your own fiscal year ending. Independent studios are just going to pick up the slack. Those developers are watching. They're seeing these conversations that we have. They're watching these kind of videos. They're seeing these tweets. They're seeing these Reddit posts. They see what players want, and they're delivering on it. We've already seen quite a few other companies do it already, and we're going to see even more of them do it in the future. So if AAA isn't going to do it, somebody else will. And that's already been proven. So yeah, that's really all I got for the video. I... It's so weird, dude. Like, I just want to get back to playing Dragon's Dogma 2. I didn't really want to have to make a video like this, but I have to at least give my honest thoughts and opinions on these kind of issues because I think it's something that's well worth saying. It's a discussion that's well worth having. And it's something that more people need to know about. More people need to be involved in stuff like this because this is exactly how we get better products in the end. And I believe that, genuinely. Probably think I'm crazy for that, but um, maybe I'm a little crazy. Anyway. So that's all I got for the video today. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, if you guys did, like, subscribe, comment down below. Catch me live. I should be live after this video post. Probably playing Dragon's Dogma 2, most likely. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. So stay cool, stay righteous, stay safe. And most of all, I'll see you in the next video. Peace. Family, family, family.